because as soon as you're worried about the downside, you know, you're then paralyzed to make any decisions or you play things far too safe. Hello listeners, welcome to another episode of the Directors Club podcast brought to you by Cumbria Chamber of Commerce. In this series, we get to explore some of the most interesting characters, directors, and leaders from Cumbria, and perhaps on occasion beyond. The Directors Club is kindly sponsored by Rachel Bell Wealth Management and Muckle LLP. Today, I'm here with Edmund Wood, owner and founder of Bellgrove Rum, a pioneering Cumbrian rum, which was born of Edmund's passion to find the thing, and which was inspired by Kinder and Nutella. I think this is going to be a good one, so let's get into it. Hello, Edmund. Hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to chat. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem. So for those who don't know you, can yeah. you start by telling me a bit about your background and where you're from? Yeah, sure. So uh, grew up in the Lake District. Um, Cartmel is, is home home for me. Sticky toffee pudding, lovely place to come from. Um, so yeah, grew up there and then um, went down to London for uni, um, did physics. Don't know how much of a background you'd want, but that's what you're getting. <laughs> did physics and then went to work um, for Associated British Foods. So they've got um, oh, so many things like Jordan's cereal, Rye Vita, you know, Patak's like big old company. Um, straight after uni, went to work there, um, and it was really good. Learned learned a ton of, you know, a ton of stuff about you know how things are made um, and how how they move around, which ended up being really useful. Um, you know, I think a, a chunk of the reason why I went into rum was because I knew how to make things, manufacture it, and sell it. Um, so that came in really handy. So so worked for them for sort of six years, uh, running uh, a cooking oil factory down in London and then uh, noodle warehousing and distribution um, from their Manchester site. Um, and then left there um, and then started Belgrove Rum. So that's the whistle stop tour of time frame. Crikey. So what, right back to the very beginner, what yeah. was your very first job after you left school? Uh, so it was it was being a supply planner um, at the cooking oil factory in Enfield. So that's that was you know the first job in the door. So it was um, so yeah, a big old factory made anything from big twenty liter drums of oil down to little sort of two hundred mil bottles. Um, so it was planning all the raw materials coming in. You know the tin plate that makes the drums, the oil, the caps, all of that. Planning the production um, and then making sure we've got you know enough of each product to go with each sales order going out the door to a customer. So it was a really good, it was a really good first job in terms of understanding how supply chain works because you'd be, you know, bringing everything in and it comes from, you know, all the different products would come from lots of different, you know, countries around the world, um, you know, different sort of lead times. You might have to order it two weeks in advance or six months um, and understanding a little bit about how, um, you know, contracts work because, you know, the contract purchasing team would be buying, you know, because the oil and the tin was were commodities. Um, so you get a little bit of exposure to that. Um, you get exposure to, you know, quality control for the products and, you know, artwork in terms of stuff that's printed. So it's a really, really useful sort of learning in terms of, you know, how stuff is made. You know, food and drink is, you know, a massive industry. All, all, all touched by it. So to get a bit of a really good understanding, I think did me, you know, a lot of good. And in terms of later, when I come to look for what I wanted to do, it needed to be something that I had some kind of background in, um, something that I was passionate about, and then something that there was a market opportunity for. So those sort of three circles overlapping in a little, a little Venn diagram. The background that I got from working. Um, for Westmill definitely helped in terms of, you know, an area which I had some skills in. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really good. It will have definitely helped form, you know, what I wanted to go into. Um, and then after, yeah, after the supply planning job, um, moved into like shift management. So you'd be, you know, running one of the shifts with maybe 30 people in your team. Um, 
and you know then working with you know the new supply planner um and all the kind of supervisors line techs operatives to make sure that you know we delivered the production plan so then that was that was then a really good sort of experience of you know managing a team um mm. which you know is really useful when you then start your own thing how you um you know whether it's accountant brand designer logistics partner you know you're all you know it's it's your team even if you you know there might be a third party contractor it's all essentially still your team and getting people one of the big things i think a lot of startups find is that you know when you begin you're a tiny little minnow and you often want to work with you know quite big companies you want to work with good big companies because you want you know you want their expertise and you want to also be able to scale and grow when you do get bigger you want them to still be able to you know easily handle your business so instead of starting teeny tiny um you know i started you know working with a big logistics provider so that when i grew i was already with them they could cope with you know bigger volumes um so yeah trying to get people to you know take you seriously enough to take on when take you on when you're a minnow um is a big thing so learning how to manage a team work with other stakeholders work you know working with other departmental managers back at westmill is you know that sort of like the peer to peer managing that you have um when you're trying to work with big logistics providers or bottling companies or you know brand designers so mm -hmm. yeah that was that was definitely really useful as well um because you know you need to make sure that you know you get on well you you know clear demanding but not too demanding and also very well aware of the fact that you're a teeny tiny unknown business you're a minnow but you have big ambitions so it's mm -hmm. it's a delicate balance to strike which um i think a lot of startups have you know yeah. that's that struggle when they get going so but did you yeah, find that, that that experience in the huge business that is you know associated british foods and you know mm. where you were talking about that the oil factory is mm. that do you think that that is fundamental to where you are now what you learned there or do you think you would still be where you are now with belgrove from if, if i you hadn't, hadn't done been that. there yeah um i'll never know but i guess you know because you know when you when you sort of come out of uni and look at you know different jobs you know before this i was looking at jobs in um before the the oil factory in uh, tesco's technology department who they were sort of you know refining you know the self service checkout so you know i could have easily been you know gone down a different path um but then you know the job with westmill came through um so yeah it is a funny one in terms of the path you end up going down you know lots of people who just you know they get you know whatever decent job they can find after uni because you know we all needed jobs um and then it has a massive impact on the rest of your life but um you know i i do all, i did always like making stuff i'm i'm more practical than techy because in terms of when i was trying to come up with ideas looking at a few sort of you know software based ones but that's not my area of skill i couldn't do the programming and i wouldn't know it well enough to be able to sort of if i hired someone to do it i wouldn't know whether they were doing a perfect job or not so i i suppose you know i would have probably always gone into something more practical and you know that that is also the job i got out of uni i might have ended up in a different one very easily but you know was in the more practical manufacturing based job and then when it came to looking at what i wanted to do a key thing was you know what have i got any skills in you know got to play to my strengths and making stuff practical stuff um was what my skills were in that was what my job had been in you know that a lot of that sort of methodical planning whether that's supply planner or when you're a shift manager planning you know your team rather than the products themselves and manufacturing you know planning who's going to do what when so that that is my bag um you know being in food and drink that's you know the area of manufacturing i've been in and you know i love food and drink it's always been like a really you know whenever we were growing up i mean still now you know if you'd have something to celebrate you know like tons of people you'd go out for a nice meal have a nice meal in it's such a wonderful just like simple traditional homely thing so mm -hmm. it just it just made perfect sense that it would always be like food and drink that had always been my bag and my job and it just sort of 
yeah, made sense. And then it was, and then market opportunity was the last thing, yeah. you know, it, even if you love it and even if you've got experience in it, if there's no market opportunity, it's pointless. Like, yeah, yeah, you've got to make sure that third bit's there. Let's talk about uni. What, why mm. physics? Uh, I, I had, um, I had a really good teacher. So, so back at sixth form, uh, I did maths, biology, physics, and I definitely wasn't going to do uh, maths at uni, not, not massively my bag. I had, a, I had a really great biology teacher. So it was largely based on teachers, great biology teacher, Mr. Watton. Um, and then also a really good physics teacher. I remember Mr. Redhead and he had sort of big frizzy curly hair, like Einstein. He wore like a big puffer jacket and like Nike Air Max. And he was, he was, yeah, just amazing. Like he didn't really care like how he, how he looked. And he just loved physics and that sort of, uh, yeah, I think that just rubbed off on a lot of people that he, he was, he was cool in the way that he loved physics and he didn't care how he looked like I wear mm. big, big Air Max and a puffer jacket because it's comfy and I'm a bit cold. Like, and, it, and just, yeah, absolutely yeah. loved it. You know, never trying to be cool to impress the kids. Um, just loved what he did. He was just and did it 100% well. himself, yeah. just authentic. Yeah. It, and I, it's and, amazing, yeah, isn't that. it? Like how much teachers can really influence the mm. path of your life. And I think that's yeah. something that, you know, people don't talk about that enough. Mm. I still remember I've got two amazing teachers. One was also a biology teacher mm. and one was a maths teacher. I was mm. convinced that I was stupid in school. Mm. And I couldn't mm. do maths. And I got mm. like, the highest grade I could possibly get in the set that I was in because mm. I had an awesome maths teacher. Yeah. So like Mr. Bingham, my maths teacher, and Mr. Moody, yeah. my biology teacher, yeah. were awesome. And yeah. I think that if it hadn't been for those two, mm. God knows what I would be doing yeah. because they were yeah. like, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, I find them, I do find them, you know, very inspiring. And as you say, they do have a massive impact on your life. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I picked biology at A-level because Mr. Watton was awesome. And he, he was fun and he cared and he, you know, always took a real interest in you. And yeah, so yeah, that's the reason I, you know, did that then. And then for the physics, um, I, I, I really did enjoy it. And I, I love, I always loved understanding how things worked. And, and you got that with physics from, you know, why different products and substances have the properties they have or, you know, anything of that physical nature you know classical mechanics you know when you throw a ball why does it do a certain arc through the air all of that very applicable day-to-day -day stuff I really loved that but then when you know did that because I enjoyed it you get to uni and it is heavily maths based which wasn't really my bag so on reflection you know maybe I would have done something more uh, engineering focused um, or maybe something a bit more businessy I mean, we had business studies at school, but it wasn't, I didn't do it and it wasn't, you know, not exactly a mini MBA. It wasn't Brill. Um, but, you know, it would, it would be great if there was more business focused stuff at, at sixth form because you come out and you don't, you know, coming out of uni, you don't really know how any of it works. You never, you never understand, I mean, anything from a pension to how that works to even like simple profit and loss stuff I think if people understood a little bit more even back at sixth form you know even before uni that would massively you know open people's eyes as to you know who starting your own business is a thing and you know this these are the bare bones basics how business works because you don't really learn anything about anything you know anything real world practical so um yeah, if I was going back, something maybe more engineering and something a bit more businessy or economicsy, um, because anything I'd learned, I'd just sort of, sort of picked up from dad or just reading. Um, so yeah, I did physics because of that, and then once I'd finished it, um, I didn't want to go into um, research, which is sort of what a third of people did. Um, didn't want to go into banking, which is what another third did. I did just other something else, which is what the remaining third did, you know, various things. And so my year went into, you know, like manufacturing. But, um, but yeah, I think I've used my physics a handful of times directly, but I still do really uh, appreciate it because it just gives you a nice, good, solid scientific understanding 
of stuff, all like the stuff in the world, um, I think it gives you a good sort of base layer of thinking as to, you know, you know, how stuff's work, where, you know, whether that's packaging up, you know, some delicate bottles of, of rum to send off or, you know, picking, you know, different, uh, you know, label and ink qualities, because when the labels rub together, you don't want to get any chipping on the bottles. So just all of these teeny tiny little things that you have with a physical product that having sort of a bit of a physics brain on you really helps with because it's all physical product. Um, it's all the properties of all the stuff. It does, mm. does end up being really useful, yeah. So that, that's really interesting that you said, oh, I've probably only used it a handful of times. <laughs> and I was sitting here thinking, well, actually, by the yeah. sounds of it, you use it every day. And, and it's yeah, that subconsciously, mindset, yeah. isn't it? Like yeah. getting into the reads of stuff and knowing, yeah. knowing your pro product inside and out like why have you mixed it together the way that you have why yeah. have you chosen the bottle that you've chosen why have yeah. you chosen the labels and sometimes yeah. I guess the you know customers might look at it and go oh you've picked that bottle because it's a really nice bottle or mm. you've picked that label because it's a really nice label but actually your thought process is well I don't want that to rub together and I don't want it to chip and mm. I don't want it to so mm. there's so much more goes into it and I think mm. with these what I would call an, an artisan brand when you support mm. a smaller artisan brand mm. You've really put your heart and soul into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's my little baby that you that you craft. Um, but it is great. And even stuff I remember working out, because um, you want the back label to be hidden. When you look at the bottle, you want the back label to be hidden as much as possible when you look at it from the front, or else you'll get sort of the shadow in the back. So I remember even, you know, working out the height of the back label, being like, right, if it's on a bar, at x height and your y amount of meters away and your eyes are on average this high what height does the label need to be at the back in order to obscure the back label you know to the maximum so you don't see this ugly shadow when you're looking through a bottle and even even st just all of that stuff i love doing that <laughs> that sounds, sounds a so bit did boring, you work out a formula it. have you got like a yeah. perfect formula of yeah you some, look somewhere at yeah bottle? it was just sort of it was just sort of you know working out the angles um to, to to figure out yeah what was the best because it wasn't bang in the middle you wanted it slightly different but yeah I love all of that stuff <laughs> it sounds a bit lame but I love it <laughs> no I think that's absolutely yeah. amazing that you have yeah. actually worked out and put so much care and attention into yeah. a product that you have worked yeah. out that if you stand a certain distance away from the bar yeah, yeah. and you will won't be able to see the the back, back label, label. Yeah. it's all those tiddly things that if you don't think about them you know, and then you end up making it and you're like, oh, can I can see the label through the bottle and it just doesn't look very good. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, yeah, love doing that. Love doing that. <laughs> Did you take into an account women wearing high heels? Ah. Did you put a variance in for that? No, Is that like a I just took buffer? average height, average height. <laughs> but, um, but that stuff, and other things like, um, you know, the labels, so you can't just pick, sort of you know a paper for your label and be like yeah i love that one because you know depending on the thickness of it you know the thicker the label when it's getting applied by the labeler if it's too thick it won't bend enough to go around the bottle and stick on so you, then you need to look at you know different quality papers or different quality adhesives so there's just there's so much in it that if you don't think about it you'll end up with a rubbish product with a peeling label and all of that but I love thinking so, about all those things. Are you a perfectionist? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always think, well, it might as well be done correctly, which means perfectly, you know, because it's just, yeah, just a bit lazy to do it imperfectly. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll know if it's not done right. Like, I'll know. Like, even if mm. it's small enough that other people won't pick it up, it's like, well, I, well, I know it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not right. So but, I'm not um, sending it out But, the yeah, door. I think... I think um, you know, if you want to get into, you know, big retailers and you want to really get somewhere and have a really sharp, polished image and you want to compete against the big boys in the industry, you do need to be of a disposition that puts the extra effort in to make sure it is, you know, perfect. You know, if, if a Bacardi label is a bit ripped or something, people are still going to buy it because it's Bacardi, they know it, it's cheap. Um, but if you're trying to break into, you know, the big retailers, you know, you can't afford to be imperfect mm. on on any aspect of it. So, yeah, having the disposition to 
making sure it's right is you know is really useful kind of necessary mm -hmm. if you want to make it yeah yeah so yeah. we're getting quite into the reads of the product but you worked your way up didn't you and then you left to start mm. Balgrove from but yeah. you didn't actually know you were going to start Balgrove from so where exactly. did you end up in your career and how so, did you end up where you are now so um so the West Mill, the oil factory in Enfield. So yeah, supply planner, shift manager, manufacturing manager, and then moved up to their Manchester site, which was the big noodle manufacturing site um, to be warehouse and distribution manager. And then I'd always wanted to, always wanted to start my own firm. Just it had always been in my head to do it. Dad had always done his own thing and it was always what I wanted to do. But the more I sort of thought on it, I didn't know if I just liked the idea of doing it and it wasn't really for me, or whether I was just a bit scared and I needed to just take the leap and go for it. And I didn't know which one it was. And I thought, well, the only way to do it is take the leap. And if you love it, brilliant, you know, crack on. Or if you hate it, it doesn't work. It's, it's just too stressful and awful, you know, go and get another job. But I just knew I had to sort of, you know, jump, take the leap. And also, um, I had a friend, uh, Pip of Pip and Nut, the Nut Butter brand, um, doing really, really well, mate from uni. And she was a big inspiration um, because she didn't have, you know, a background in, you know, manufacturing products. Um, and she went into an apparently saturated market, but she's done really, really well because she's got a great product and a great brand and worked really hard. So me thinking, you know, when I eventually you know, then came to look at spirits. I was like, you know, I, I haven't got a background in spirits, you know, manufacturing, but, um, but it looks saturated, but, you know, if I have a great product and a great brand, I could do it. So, so Pip was a big inspiration. Um, and yeah, in terms of the idea, so I hadn't had it. And I thought I can't just keep saying, you know, oh, I never did it because I hadn't had the idea and working, you know, up in Trafford Park, it's not a very inspirational place. And, you know, a big job takes all of your, your brain space. So I thought, you know, I just need to, I just need to go and leave and, and look for inspiration. So yeah, handed my notice in, you know, three months notice felt like forever. Um, I was going to go in search of, you know, an idea. So did a, you know, a few holidays, bit of traveling and, and searching for inspiration, you know, something I could, you know, bring back to the UK. Or, or something and then after a couple of months still hadn't had the idea I remember going on um, uh, a website startups.co.uk um, looking at trends and came across Mezcal which is like the sister spirit of tequila like one of the agave based um, <clears throat> uh, another agave based spirit um, but Mezcal was still too niche so I then I then had a look at vodka but it already premiumized and then sort of through another few little things, sort of rediscovered rum. And I'd never really liked rum. Ne never really been my, my sort of drink of choice. You know, you'd have it in a mojito, but, you know, like spiced rum and navy rum, like gross. Um, but then sort of tried this one. It was like a vanilla infused rum and it was just absolutely delicious. Um, and I was like, you can have really delicious flavoured rum. Like that's possible. Like I'd, I'd never had it, didn't think it was, you know, even possible um and it was amazing i was like i think i think there's a gap there um and also brands like so many of them sort of were either piratey or caribbean -y, you know or navy or you know none of them really were that inspiring to me um, everyone does think of pirates when you say rum i love yeah. rum to the fact mm. that my friends probably have said that i was either a pirate or a salty wench in a former life. <laughs> so I will take that. And I, I love that you've made this rum. Oh. And I'm so excited to get some because I think it looks oh. just and sounds delicious. Thanks so much. Um, and then, yeah, so it's just sort of that moment of sort of clarity and opportunity there. So, you know, I thought, you know, gin has been completely, you know, reborn with all these incredible you know, uh, like craft brands that uh, look gorgeous. And another big brand inspiration was Woodford Reserve, the bourbon. And it it looks cool. It looks classic. It'll still be cool in another 10, 20 years. It's like, oh, you know, that's just, you know, magic. I love that brand. So, yeah, I went about thinking, you know, creating a brand that I loved in the rum space that was a bit more contemporary. 
it's still premium. Uh, and then for flavor, it was, oh, I don't just want to make a, you know, a bog standard rum, but, you know, they exist. Um, but something that, you know, brought something new to the party. Um, and I didn't just want to put a twist on a spiced rum because I thought, you know, that's not, it's not that interesting. And it also didn't sort of scratch my itch in terms of wanting to really create something because that's what I was chasing, you know, bring something into the world. Um, so I thought, well, a good place to start would be making a list of all the flavors I love or the products I love. And there's bound to be something in there. So literally started writing down Kinder Bueno, Dairy Milk Whole Nut, Snickers, Florentines, Frangelico, Sticky Toffee Pudding. And I was like, there's something in here. Chocolatey, nutty. Mm. And then and then it was like hazelnut. I just, I just love hazelnuts. You know, mm. I like a Dairy Milk Whole Nut. Just love it um so so yeah literally to trial the first thing just got got some fresh hazelnuts roasted them de-skinned them crushed them got some vanilla pods like you know skinned skin them got you know the the paste out in the middle um put it in some golden rum and left it for a few days and i, I remember the tiny little sort of shot glass trying it at dad's house um and smiling and i was like this is what i quit my job for this right, is it, okay. this tiny little glass. And that, that will always stick with me, that moment of like, yeah, you know, thinking back to, you know, when I drove out the gates for the last time back at West Mill in Trafford Park, not knowing where this journey would take me, not knowing what business it would be. Fast forward a few months and, you know, jumping, you know, off the cliff to try and find something and hoping it would work out, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, had started to pay off because you know get some headspace look in the market yeah. um you know look what you're good at um you know look what you love um and it's like yeah i think there might be something in infused rum and it, you know i'd seen what had happened with gin and sort of as you as you learn more about the market um you know you, you get to grips with whether your idea is any good or not and sort of you know i started to understand that spirits tend to operate often in sort of eight year cycles from sort of bust to boom to bust again. So we've obviously seen the big gin boom and then it plateaued, you know, saturated. A lot of brands either got business or get, you know, bought out, consolidated. Um, and rum was roughly four years behind. So when, when gin was, you know, plateauing and saturating, rum was, you know, starting to be up and coming. Um, so we now have this rum boom at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as there are more interesting brands, more interesting flavors, um, you know, people start drinking more rum and that, you know, that in turn, that increase in demand drives more supply. Um, so we're seeing that more at the moment and all the little bits in the trade that you sort of noticed with gin, you then start seeing with rum. So little tiny things that, you know, more uh, just rum specific bars pop up or, or bars which have, you know, a specific rum menu now, um, or cocktails historically made with different spirits now being made with rum. So like a rum old fashioned or a rum espresso martini and the, all these little bits that, you know, as soon as consumers are drinking more and there's the demand, bars then obviously put on rum um, from the supply side. So you sort of, once you start getting into it and you sort of see these bits happening, you're like, Okay, there's a bit of traction. We're getting yeah, somewhere. Yeah, there's stuff happening here. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it is. It it was very good in terms of timing, and timing is, you know, a monstrous part of it. You know, if you've got you know a good product, but you you know too late or too early, um, it you know won't work. But timing is, you know, I've learned a monstrous part of it. Um, and then you know went about once I'd figured on hazelnut. Um, how you sort of commercialize that how do you you know manufacture this on a big scale so then that took a long time to find you know a bottling partner ingredients suppliers get set up for um you know warehousing logistics obviously there's tons of licensing with alcohol so you know you've got to go on courses and you know have meetings with hmrc there's a monstrous amount of of stuff but i sort of think that it doesn't you know, it doesn't matter how hard, how high the bar is in terms of all this prerequisite stuff you've got to do as long as I can get over it. Because the tougher it is, the fewer people are going to do it. So make, 
you know, I don't mind if it's quite tough to get all your licenses because then you don't have as many competitors. If the barrier to entry is really, really low, the market mm-hmm. would be super mm-hmm. flooded. So, yes, it is, you know, tough to get up and running in the booze industry, but, you know, it's not always a bad thing if it's mm-hmm. if there's a lot to have to do. You know, that might put a lot of people off, but it's an opportunity because, you know, it means it's less saturated. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, I didn't mind that too much. And it's, it is quite interesting learning. In learning something, you know, new and something that's going to be useful. Um, uh, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. When you decided to hand your notice in, because yeah. that's a very brave thing to do. And there's probably, <laughs> there will be people listening to this who think, God, I would love to do that. Yeah. I would love to just hand my notice in and go and find the thing that I want to do. That's yeah. a really brave, that's a really brave thing that, that you did. How yeah. long did it take you to psych yourself up for that? And what did um, you put in place to enable yourself to do it? Because I think that is sometimes yeah. a barrier to people of going, yeah, well, I could never do that because X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. And I remember um, I chatted to one of my colleagues um, at, at my old firm before, just uh, before I left, but before like the announcement goes out that you're leaving and said, because I, I knew he sort of was keen to, you know, go at some point in the future. I said, you know, don't, you know, don't feel like you owe your life to the company, you know. Um, and he was, oh, you know, I'd love to go and do what you've done. But he was like, oh, you know, I've got a mortgage and and it gets trickier if you've got, you know, mortgages and, and dependents and stuff. Um, and it is, you know, I, I needed to take the leap and it's, you know, it's either, you know, a really good idea or crazy depending on the outcome. And you don't know at the time. So you've got to take the risk. And, yeah. and as I said, you know, I didn't know whether... I was just scared of taking the leap and needed to jump and I would love it or, you know, or I'd hate it. And quite rightly, I, you know, it was really, you know, mm-hmm. I was really reluctant to do it. And, you know, I just knew take the leap and if you love it, great. If you hate it, come back. But in terms of, you know, how you can do it, all you can do is sort of de-risk it. So the only commitment I had when I left was a 15 pound a month phone contract, nothing else. So moved out of the house I was in, um well a because i was going to go away do some traveling but you know stay with parents when i got home um you know so no mortgage no kids you know 15 pounds a month was was all i was committed to spend <laughs> so mm-hmm. if you de- you know all, all you can really do is you know de-risk it as much as you can save up as much as you can um to have as long a runway as possible and by runway you know i mean you know what are your costs going to be to set it up is x and then once you're physically set up and had your launch day how much are you going to need to spend each month you know as overheads and then to grow and then you know the money you've got left over how many months will that buy you have you got a runway that will give you launch plus six months or launch plus 12 months so the bigger runway you can have the better Mm -hmm. um and yeah, and it and it took a few months to sort of come up with the idea. And obviously, then you know you're spending money and you're not bringing any in. And even once you've launched, you know it takes a while to get positive. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, got sort of you know bar jobs, temporary jobs, worked at Legoland, uh, building Lego with kids, worked at gigs, pulling pints during Liam Gallagher gigs. And mm-hmm. you've just you've sort of um, when you're starting up you know you might think oh you know I can't go back to pulling pints but you just sort of got to swallow your pride a little bit and be like if and pulling if pulling pints gets me my dream of having my own company that was one day really successful that that's fine that's well worth it so I mm-hmm. don't know if some people are sometimes put off because they're like oh you know I'm not gonna I'm too proud to deliver pizza in the evenings whilst I you know work on my you know dream in the daytime but you, you know you hear stories of people who did that and then they've gone on to have really successful businesses. So you do have yeah. to sort of battle that internal, you know, dialogue of, oh, you know, you can't possibly do that. Because well, interestingly, I think the guy that started Deliveroo hmm. started it because he was delivering takeaways to his friends on his bike. Ah, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, perfect. So you you just yeah. you just do it, don't you? You just yeah. get on with it. Yeah, what? you just gotta do it, crack on. And 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 that was, you know, because it brought a bit of money in. And it gives you some structure and focus because when you're starting up, you know, you go from being in a highly structured environment where you've got meetings every day, every week, you've got a boss and you know, it's highly structured to being like, 
you know, you're in charge, you have to do everything. Um, and you have to push things forward. You obviously have to try and come up with those ideas and figure out if they're any good or not. It is, you know, it's like you're on a little raft out at sea and you're trying to figure out which way to go. And so, it, yeah, it's quite tough. So have a little bit of structure of, of, you know, even doing temp jobs brings money in and also make some connections. So, you know, I did, you know, some shifts working at the Etihad Stadium in Manchester and you start to get some connections with the beverage manager, you know, sometimes you do look a bit crazy because you'll be chatting to them and to them you're you know often just another temp worker on minimum wage pulling pints and then I'm there like yeah I'm going to start a rum company how do I sell you my rum in the future you, you sound like cuckoo um but you because, stand out you do stand out and you're yeah. memorable yeah, but sort of, you know, probably sometimes don't get taken that seriously. But sometimes, like chatting to the beverage manager there, and he takes it seriously. And he's like, yeah, get in contact once you've launched. And, you know, you've got to sort of swallow your pride a little bit. Just go for it. Even if you sound a bit crazy to some people, you know, when it does work out and you get some good contact details. But, yeah, yeah the yeah the pre-launch was the toughest thing by far because, you know, big issues on ingredient sourcing, branding, you know, pulling it all together and you've got to develop a really thick skin really quickly You because you, you'll either develop that skin or you'll just crumble and burn mm, and you've got mm -hmm. to, you know, when you're, you know, trying to pull things together and move this massive, you know, machine along as you're trying to create something is really tough. Um, and when you start and initially and you're trying to create, you know, create something and when eventually you have to press go and say, you know, bottle a thousand bottles of this, it is very, very stressful. At least once mm -hmm. you've made it and once it's out there, you've got something to work with, something to sell. Um, but the yeah. pre-launch pre is, is a lot scarier and a lot tougher mm -hmm. to battle through because you're just in it on by yourself. Yeah. yeah, it's not. And a lot of people think, you know, being a startup, you know, is all, um, you know, beanbags and drinking rum and, and millions of pounds. And it's like, if you wanted you know, go and stack shelves in Tesco. And that is a surer way to earn more money for the first few years, by far, like mm -hmm. absolutely definite, because you've got to, you know, put money into it, you know, and in the beginning, you're not making, you know, profit from day one. Um, so it's, it's not as glamorous as people think it is, you know, after a little bit, you do get some wonderful freedoms, which is great. Um, but it is, yeah, it is very tough. And when, you know, when I was, you know, like creating the new rums, the first rum, uh, the hazelnut rum, and then creating the new rum, the spiced fig and blackberry, people think it's, you know, just dreamy that, you know, your job is, you know, tasting different rums. Um, but what far outweighs the pleasure of tasting these different rums is the absolute, like the monstrous responsibility to get it right because your business and your life depends on it. So that outshadows mm -hmm. how pleasurable it is. Because if you don't get it right, you know, you, you begin to ruin your company if one of yeah. your products is rubbish. So the, the, the pressure to get that and in terms of, you know, trying to figure out what the right flavor is, like big picture and then the nuances, um, is very, very difficult. And trying to come up with something which isn't just going to be a flash in the pan you know, good for a few months that's going to have longevity, it is very difficult and very stressful because, you know, as, as the rum market emerges, it's not, it's not clearly defined. I mean, of course not, like which way it'll go, what flavours, what people will like, and you've got to sort of make your best educated guess. So for the hazelnut rum, it's great with Coke, it's great with ginger beer, it's espresso martinis, it's old fashions and it's neat. So you've got sort of, a great remit of drinks and then for the berry one you know again neat coke ginger beer and then mojitos daiquiris so you've got to sort of create it in the hope that you've designed it that you know it's going to go well with you know all of these drinks that people want to drink um and it's um yeah it's, it's very more stressful than people think mm -hmm. creating a new rum it's not the pleasure is way outweighed by if you don't get it right this is has horrendous consequences you know you're really brand on financially it would cripple you if you you know embark on making thousands of bottles of something that the market doesn't like because you can't ask 
tons of people before you make it because you know the development is quite long you don't want to talk about it too much because even with the hazelnut i kept that under wraps but still 12 months after i brought mine out there was a copycat hazelnut rum out so you can't share it too far and wide it's just sort of mm -hmm. an inner circle um and in terms of designing you know the flavor profile that you want to go with so like a spiced fig and blackberry then also the nuances of the flavor you've got a, it's sort of two levels of where you're going because it could be the finest flavor of whatever you picked but if that overall flavor profile isn't something people are going to want to drink it doesn't matter how good it is you know it could be the finest goji berry rum in the world but if no one wants to drink a goji berry rum you're stuffed so yeah. it is um yeah it's tough because you're trying to you're trying to create something um, without the R&D department that Bacardi has or the reach that they have in, you know, knowing what has worked well for them in different markets and, and stuff. And they've got, they've got money, you know, millions of pounds to put into, you know, whether that's R&D or, you know, if it doesn't go well, because, you know, lots of companies have products that haven't done well, they can afford to make another one, whereas I don't. This needs to be mm -hmm. right first time. So, um yeah. yeah it's it's far more stressful than um people think it is i'd say you know there's a lot of i think in startups in general there's a lot of sort of glamorization of you know you just tootle around you know your own boss and drink rum um but yeah it's there's incredibly lot, stressful there's a lot that people don't see yeah that goes media, into a startup. yeah yeah exactly and social media you know you, you, yeah, you don't always put the tough bits on. Yeah. If you've had a monstrously tough day, there isn't the selfie of, oh, yeah, I'm really struggling today. <laughs> you put the selfie up, which is like, <laughs> we've got a new stockist. It's yeah. looking good. I tried to do my it. tax return and yeah. the internet went off and I couldn't yeah. get everything submitted yeah, yeah. through the package. Yeah. And I don't know how that works. And yeah, I've just exactly. got a huge tax bill. You don't put yeah. that on where you're like, nah, no one does. A few, a few firms do do a sort of behind the scenes angle um and i think it's really good when they do but still the mm -hmm. temptation you know in the early days when you're a smaller business um you just don't want to put it on because even though some people will see it and be like oh that's wonderful you know like that's the real person behind the job other people or big buyers will see it and they'll be like are oh, they're a tiny little operation you know if they're struggling to you know understand you know something on a tax return uh, we're not confident in them to be able to supply us as a proper firm. So the like the early day stuff mm -hmm. you can't, you know, now I'm bigger, you know, you could give a bit more behind the scenes footage. But um yeah. But yeah, especially in the early days, like everyone wants to show this, you know, polished image of like a big successful business. Um but yeah, the reality is really, really tough. And yeah. it takes no like, nobody knows everything. Even in these yeah. huge businesses, no one knows everything. Yeah, yeah. And often so, in um, the bigger businesses, when you're sitting around the table with some of yeah. the big bosses yeah. they often know less than you do and i'm speaking yeah. from personal experience yeah. on that and i'm sure lots yeah. of other people would agree yeah i'm sure they would i'm sure they would <laughs> do you find now that the the noise around about you has changed so what people are saying to you did they say you're absolutely crazy to, to do this or this is absolutely amazing like good luck what was the overwhelming noise around you? And has that has um, that changed as you've gone through and you've launched and you've got a successful product and you're developing more? Has that changed around about you or do you not take much notice of it? Um, um, I, I guess the internal sort of monologue as to how I how well I thought it would do is, is the most important one, not to sound braggy, but, you know, some people, you know, you know, lots of people always champion you, but oh, it's amazing. And, you know, it's such a great idea. They might not really know. Or some people will be like, oh, it's terrible. And they might not really know. But you're the only one who really knows how it's how it's doing and how well you think your chances are. And sort of in the in the, the months and months before launching, um, when it was really tough, I, I couldn't see how I could ever get to launch day. It just seemed impossible. And then, you know, when I launched it, because you've got to do everything yourself, including, you know, the big picture strategy, as well as the teeny tiny, I've got to book a parking space when I'm going to do that market, the big and the little. Um, it's a lot. And also trying to work enough on the big picture, you know, how am I ever going to get a big listing in the future? You've got to work on that, which takes a lot. At the same time as doing the tiny stuff that's going to pay the, you know, the bills in the next, you know, 
few months and trying to sort of break out of that very short term focus is really tough because the big pick stuff, you know, takes a lot of time and doesn't bring immediate money in and you might spend ages on it. Um, but you need to do it if you're actually going to get out of the small mm. sort of the small leagues that you're currently in. So internally, definitely at the beginning, once you launched and the sort of come down post launch and how tough that 2019 was, because I had one year pre pandemic. So I had 2019 big year, you know, you do a lot, you spend a lot, you try and get it like out there, you do, you know, PR campaigns, tons of events, trade shows, consumer shows. And you sort of start to figure out what works. And then, you know, three months into my second year, then COVID hit. And in that sort of, um, so, so now my firm's, you know, three years, four months old, because I started beginning of 2019. Um, and definitely in the first sort of half of it, you, you, you have massive times of doubt when you're like, oh, I don't see how this can ever be a success. You know, I've got a good product, but how do I grow it? How do I compete? The, the amount of time that you have to put into trying to get listings with bars is, is huge. So much time. Then you've got like listing fees as well if you want to get on a cocktail menu. So you're like, God, I'm not making any money, but I've got to grow the brand. And then, you know, in the future, you know, I'll make money. Um, so that, that, yeah, immensely tough. And then it was sort of, um, you know, a few months into sort of halfway through 2020, you know, you know, when COVID had hit and all of my, I was heavily focused on bars and all those sales went to zero. So you're like, oh my God, like it's really tough. Um, but everyone was in, you know, a boat similar, but, you know, I didn't have massive overheads. So that was a blessing. Yeah. Um, but then you just got to sort of re-strategize, um, switch away from bars towards shops and you know move online look at export and all of those do take a while to mm. you know sort of get going um but i um now or you know after you know the main episodes of covid um definitely in a much stronger position to what i think i would have been if there wasn't covid and i'd carried on on my previous trajectory of focusing on bars because it's you know you got to if there's 28 shots in a bottle you've got to sell 28 drinks to go through a bottle whereas you know you have to make one sale to sell an entire bottle when you're in a shop so it's you know a factor of you know 28 times more if you can get that bottle sale um so i think yeah it's had the last 18 months you know really did force me to you know re-strategize and start going after sort of bigger chunkier retail and working on those bigger things and sort of if you want to get a big retail listing get a listing in places like dalesford so high-end small chain of retailers that look really good and if i want to get in there go to like the high-end independence and sort of you know work the ladder as you as you start to go up and then um so sort of back end of last year october november ish applied to uh to asda to be on the their new nurture scheme of taking on a dozen brands to you know for like a three-month trial to nurture them um and and got onto that and i remember like that happening and and quite an emotional time of course because it's sort of more than the three years you've been launched it's you know the 18 months prior to that you know it's a chunk of five years you know this is what i've worked for for the last half decade um you know getting into big retail you know all those tough times and you think you know you've plugged away and you're eventually getting somewhere, you know, big pick. Because, I mean, the hazelnut rum, very, you know, chuffed because that got into Selfridges just after we launched. But that is, you know, great, great place to be, but teeny tiny volume. But being in one of the, the big four retailers was, was game changer. So that, that trial started end of March. So amazing to be, you know, tapping into bigger retail. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it takes a lot longer than people think, costs more. Is more stressful than people think. It's less glamorous and mm-hmm. harder work. Yeah. And if you weren't, it, and that's amazing that you're like, I, I didn't really yeah. listen to anyone outside. And I guess that's back to what you said about having a really thick skin. But yeah. you're incredibly driven, and it doesn't sound like you've been knocked back. And even if you have been knocked back, you've powered through it. What yeah. What is it that keeps you going? What is that drive? Um, I, I mean, fam- having having good solid family around me. Um, parent, sister, that's massively supportive. You know, that makes that makes a lot of difference when, you know, they really, you know, believe in you, champion you, and that you're following your dreams. Um, 
because they really care. But at the same time, as much as they care, they don't always know the intricacies of how the spirits market is doing. So they can champion you, you know, 100%, but they don't, they don't know, you know, its chances of actually being a success because they don't know the nuances of the spirit market. So when I say only sort of you know, because even people who care, they don't know the intricacies of the market, or people who know the intricacies of the market, they're probably not close enough to you yeah. to sort of help or give you advice. So only sort of, only you really do know how it is. But, you know, good family support has been, you know, massively important. And also um, in terms of carrot and stick, you know, I wanted, you know, the sort of freedoms and the opportunities that come with having your own business. Um, so on the, you know, the carrot side and on the stick side, I don't want to go back and work for my old firm. <laughs> so no. you've, got, you've got the two. And also, it yeah, just driven by this this desire to you know create my own business that had always been my thing. So it's it's the carrot that you're you're chasing. Of mm-hmm. I, I don't want to fail. I don't you know I don't I don't want to be a failure. I want to mm-hmm. you know create this thing. So it does. It it's almost uh, it will be a success. I'll make it a success. You know, if this product isn't right, I'll bring out another one. Or if this business isn't right, create another. And once you have that sort of um come what may this will be a success in in whatever form that does drive you on a lot but also i think early days i think not maybe not even i must have been must have been pre-launch maybe it was sort of um because i'd always wanted to do it and this was sort of a mindset shift it was um sort of i'd rather try really hard spend all my money and go back and work for the same firm than never try it. Like I just, I needed to try it. Yeah. So once you have that sort of mindset and acceptance of, I'm going to give it my all. If it doesn't work out, I'll go back and work for my own firm. But I, I need to try it. I couldn't have not tried it. Just staying working at my old firm just wasn't an option. I always needed to, needed to try it. It always just been my dream that sort of, that having almost, the insecurity getting away at you of oh you've never done it Ed. oh you you know not good enough to start your own business mm-hmm. um and is and that can be you know as, as rubbish as that is really useful in motivating yeah. you because it you know drives you on to be like i'm good enough to start my own business ah oh, i've done it so it's when you've got that sort of thing chipping away on your shoulder that is a very good you know, it's not the most pleasurable motivator, but it's a very good motivator. And once you realise you're going to do it, you're going to try, um, you need to give it a go. And if if it doesn't work, come back to the old firm. Like, mm. that takes the pressure off a lot. And once the pressure's off, you're far more likely to succeed because you make smarter decisions. You're not as like, ooh, you know, head up in your head. Um, it's amazing what a yeah. little bit of imposter syndrome will do for motivation. Yeah, I know, yeah. But the balance, you've got to get the balance right on it um because if you have too much it's just not pleasurable at all no but you've got to sort of you know up your game so it, yeah it can be really it can be really good but um so. yeah once you'd sort of then also the other bit of mindset I just touched on in terms of you know of course I want this product to work like when you bring out the first one if it doesn't I'll bring out another or if wrong isn't it I'll do a different spirit or a different product once you have that I will make something succeed. Again, the pressure's off, so it's far more likely to succeed because mm-hmm. you just make, you make smarter decisions, you see things more clearly, um, and then that are uh, you know first product big success, second product ah big success. So um, yeah, it's it's a big sort of mental battlefield to make sure that you sort of um, you're not too worried about the downside because as soon as you're worried about the downside you know, you're then paralyzed to make any decisions or you play things far too safe um, or just don't do stuff in the smartest way if you're too busy worried about, oh God, you know what, if I make the wrong decision or what if it doesn't work, you'll spend a ton of time procrastinating or what if it doesn't work rather than like, yeah, I think this will work, but if not, I'll do something else, like I'll mm-hmm. figure it out. So like it what is, is the worst thing that can happen? It is yeah, not life yeah, and death. Exactly, exactly. So it is... It is, it is very tough mentally. It is very intense mentally. Um, 
so yeah all of those battles as you sort of create this product and then get it out there into the world and then you know whatever people make 100 percent of people aren't going to love it so you know out of a thousand if one doesn't love it you've got to learn to be okay with that but like with anyone who has anything there's you know everything is reviewed online now and you'll search for when you don't get that five star review and you you've got to make peace with the fact that you know if it's too sweet for some people it, it's going to be too dry for others um and if you can delight the absolute majority um you can't ask for any more and you've got to sort mm-hmm. of realize that as well you know whatever you do if you make a spirit if you write a book if you make music some people are gonna um not like it which yeah. is which is rubbish but if you've got the massive you majority can't please everybody it, exactly but you, but you going through that realization is again not pleasurable but you think well you know if almost everyone loves it and the odd one doesn't i'm all right with that like yeah but that again is another one of these little tough little mental battles that you need to go through and get your head around that you haven't really had before because mm-hmm. you've never been in that situation and you know, back in the old factory, if someone didn't like some noodles, it's like, I don't know, I guess maybe production didn't make them perfectly or like, it's never personal. So it, you know, you'll fix the situation and make sure the noodles are perfect next time, but it doesn't hurt you like internally, like, cause it's not your thing that you've made. Yeah, it's not, it's not heartbreak that the noodles it's are not. No, it's Whereas not. when and you've created your room yeah. and you talked about how you you got your hazelnuts and you roasted them and mm. you de-skinned them and you, you did mm. the you know the vanilla pods and then you you're like I made that yeah so you insulting my room you're yeah, insulting it's very me personal. and yeah. actually then people they're not because when yeah. someone buys a bottle of rum they don't they don't think of your face I mean, yeah. maybe they do but yeah. you know they don't think I'm I don't like you Edmund so I'm gonna yeah. you know slag off your room. That's well, not yeah. how it works, but you take it really personally. Of course. Your baby. And you think, oh, I've done a bad job of making it. I've got, you know, I've made poor decisions on the flavor. And then it's like, well, don't be ridiculous. If almost <laughs> yeah. everyone loves it and the odd one finds it too dry or too sweet, then that's fine. But all of these little things that you go through, um, all these tough little learning curves that, mm. that no one really talks about when you talk about startups, they talk about, glamorous and investment and equity and all this stuff and it's like you know like, that's just no, like a, that's not real a teeny, no it's just a teeny tiny aspect of it part of it because so, it could uh, very yeah. easily be if you let stuff like that get to you it could easily be death by a thousand cuts couldn't it because you've oh, got yeah. loads hmm. and loads of those little things that happen and you can yeah. just yeah 100 percent or you can yeah. rebel against them yeah exactly and and when whenever i chatting about like now like chatting about you know Stein Belgrove and stuff and and I always think you know if, if it inspires you know one person to do their own thing that's awesome and it's often not this sort of um, seamless glamorous startup journey of you have the idea whilst you're doing your current job you start it on the side the evenings and the weekends you build it up so it can pay you a proper wage then you know you hand your notice in you go part-time then you switch across like it doesn't always work like that it didn't work like that for me and it, it doesn't need to work like that so you know i was the other end of the spectrum didn't know what it would be so quit and went looking but um the key thing of no one else will do any of it for you and you've got to go out there and just start it and you know make it and make it happen and go and sell it you've got to do everything no one is going to do it for you um so do go and you know crack on and create it and if you need to go and search for inspiration you know go find it or i mean not that this bit applied to me but if you need to maybe start something you know if you know you want to be in a certain area but you don't know exactly what i can't say this from direct experience but I'd suggest maybe starting something just to get in the arena of being a startup. Um, You know, if I hadn't come up with this, I was going to still leave my job. I was going to work for a startup like HelloFresh. um, And I was going to do some financial studying, like the first part of uh, the ACCA. So that would at least be a step, you know, something in the right direction. And then I would have worked for the startups, you know, get in the sort of arena so if you if you're wanting to do something, don't think you have to go from zero to 
you know, I've started my own thing. You know, if you haven't had the idea like I did, you know, get in the right sphere, the yeah. zone, start meeting Just head people. in the right direction. Yeah, start, start, yeah. start something and just mm-hmm. get going. And then you'll get more comfortable with that arena of startups. Um, and then, you know, before long, you'll probably have the idea. But it is, yeah. you know, I, I remember I used to go for a pint with uh, a mate called Steve when I was back at West Mill. Still see him now. And um, we'd always catch up about what business ideas we'd had since we last had a pint. Um, and, and like we never really came up with anything any good. But I remember, like, you know, when then I had the Belgrove idea and it was like it's the first thing that's got proper legs. But, but yeah, if you want to start something, yeah, surround mm-hmm. yourself, chat to mates who are similarly inclined in terms of thinking of new ideas and stuff because that has a big you know big powerful effect you know mm-hmm. if they're in the same sphere mentally you know thinking of ideas yeah and get your creative juices flowing yes yeah yeah and i love the idea that you were a bit of a mad scientist making your room and you did your experiment yeah. and you did it all yourself <laughs> all i could think yeah. of was your science teacher being very proud yeah. of your creating <laughs> this room yeah at yeah. home yeah what was that was... like because you said that you'll never forget that having that first taste yeah. was it like because you know sometimes you have entrepreneurs go well it was like the, the light shone down from the heavens and the angels yeah. started singing and I had the idea and that was it and yeah. it doesn't always work like that yours no, was obviously very much a process and you got yeah. there what what happened when you kind of were like this well, is it I mean because before before it was rum I was sort of thinking maybe you know try something with vodka and was trying you know just before you start doing it on a mass scale and you know working with big bottling houses you just try it yourself just to see if there's any legs in the flavors and just going like going to Tesco and buying all the weird and wonderful fruits that you know never even heard of or heard of that you never really eat or going to this market stall and finding that and just steeping vodka in all of these different things like some of the standard ones so you sort of your mango your papaya all of these things just to get an idea like do any of these flavors work in vodka and then work in cocktails so yeah there's a lot of just homemade trying flavors before you then commercialize it Um, what was the worst homemade flavor that you made where you were like, this is going to be such a good idea. And then you taste it and think, I, it that was, was something, a horrendous it idea. Was, it was something fruity. I can't remember, but it, it just tasted really funky and almost a bit off. I can't even remember what it was, <laughs> but some of them were just like, yeah, that ain't working. But but even the nice vodka ones were like, it's nothing that, like, even if it was a really nice passion fruit vodka, I'd be like, oh, it's not that groundbreaking. It just didn't really mm. scratch the itch of being... Mm, something new um yeah the the one the only one that was like boom this is it it yeah. was like all this low stuff and then like wow here's a lot wrong like mm-hmm. that was good and I, I tried sort of some spiced bits as well but um the only one was like this is actually different and it tastes amazing was yeah hazelnut vanilla and there's a bit of cocoa in it as well but the the initial was just hazelnut and vanilla and it was like mm-hmm. yeah this is great so, so yeah, where did just, you go from there after that? Have you still got that bottle or did you drink it all? No, that was just a t- like literally like a shot's worth. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's just gone. So then then you sort of start to think, well, you know, how do I how do I bottle this stuff? And you either you either build a distillery, which is you know a massive, massive thing to do and you need investment, or you find uh like a bottling firm that you can you know work with and sort of contract your bottling from them so found found a really good bottling firm up north um that was a recommendation yeah lovely firm and then work with them in terms of the rum that i want to you know use all the different ingredients the bottle the labels so they saw some bits i saw some other things um and it's brilliant because they're like a brc um a grade site so they're excellent at making stuff and sort of anything bespoke i was sourcing like ingredients and and, uh and labels um and then they would source you know the caps the bottles you know the you know cardboard cases that it goes in so that was that that was you know really good firm and found an ingredient supplier um that had been recommended as well um and uh yeah labels then yeah 
that was you know a huge other beast of you know designing labels and because you, you know you're creating a new brand and this sort of the label designer i'd worked with who'd been recommended she'd she'd been the the head of design um at a, at a big supplier big manufacturer before so she knew what she was doing from a technical point of view so in terms of not going too thick on the paper because it will peel off before it's stuck on like great mm-hmm. from a technical point of view but then also excellent in design and i sort of i could give it was a fairly wide sort of area that i wanted to be within it was like i want it to be unisex um i want it to um be you know it's espresso martinis to be drunk in you know bars in like manchester and london and like you know cool places and i love i love woodford reserve and sort of and i i'd created these two really long like word documents like dozens and dozens of pages of brands that i loved and brands that i didn't love and wherever possible i would you know i, I wrote on it why i did or didn't love them sometimes i couldn't even really put my finger on it so it was like i don't know why i hate this but i do so so that was really useful because she had a a very good idea of of what i loved and what i didn't and then she didn't just you know copy and tweak one of them she still created something brand new but with all of that inspiration so it was it was a brilliant little synergy because she sort of listened to the area i wanted to sort of be in and then went off and invented something for branding and sort of came back with three initial concepts. And then it was great because there was elements on each of them that I loved. So it was like just sort of folding the paper down because I love the bottom bit of this, folding the paper up because I like the cap on this and sort of mix mm-hmm. and match from these three designs. And, you know, from that, that sort of session of presenting the three, we practically had it there, which yeah. was which was really good. And then um, we've sort of tweaked it slightly when we made um, the new Spice Fig and Blackberry rum, just to sort of just refine it, um, sort of ch- change the bottle slightly, gone to a cork closure, um, added some lovely watermarks and some more copper filing on some of the labels and just sort of just taking it up another level. Cause you know, you think you've made something perfect at the beginning and it looks amazing but then you learn all these little tweaks that you want to make, you know, different mm-hmm. cocktail on the back. And um, you sort of like with anything, you know, you refine it as you go along. You're like, yeah. Oh, this, this looks even better now. So yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, get up and running, make the best uh, product you can in terms of taste and brand learn. And then if you need to tweak taste or brand tweak it, mm-hmm. but get up and running with something very, very good um even if it's it. not perfect yeah and then in the future tweak it if you need to but i think yeah i think a lot of people you know or, you know delay a fair bit because they think oh no that you know they haven't gone yet yeah, it's, it's great get it out there they, they sort of delay not that you should put anything substandard out there but mm-hmm. there's that um um you know, get something really good out there run with it learn because you know I sort of was sure it was going to be sort of unisex millennials, espresso martinis and bars, but it's sort of maybe two thirds male, slightly older and largely drunk at home. So you do, you know, you learn a a lot about your audience and then that might, you know, and if it's, if that's where it it is, you might want to, you know, tweak some things about your, you know, instead of having a really complex recipe on the back, you might want something simpler that you can make at home because it's not always going to be sort of, you know, cocktail aficionados making the drinks. Um, so yeah, crack on, mm. crack on and learn is is a big thing. Yeah. Even though you're a self proclaimed perfectionist, <laughs> just get yeah, on with but it. it but the, but it's that, nearly there. Because, like, just go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to let anything go out there which is imperfect. So when you put it out there, you you think it's perfect when you have put yeah. it out. So version one, you do think it's perfect. It's as good as you can get it. Um, it's as good as you get it you can't think of anything else that you need to do with it and just just get it out there um and then once it's out there learn if there's any sort of tweaks that you need to make and then you realize oh maybe it wasn't perfect perfect i'll do this and then get that out there and if there's tweaks to that so sort of be a perfectionist but also don't just delay because you know you're reluctant to make a decision or you think oh maybe 
oh, maybe I need to do this to it to appeal to these people. Oh, but then I'll lose those people. Just make it as perfect as you can get it and then get it out there. Get like, it out. Don't, yeah, just don't delay for whatever reason. Just, yeah, crack on. Where did the name Belgrove Rum come from? So it came, um, so I was in the British Library down in London and was reading like everything I could about rum and distilling and the, the National Brewing and Distilling Library, which is over in Oxford. I'd been over to there and spent time going through, you know, everything they had to learn about it and also to search for a name and also been to um, the rum story um, up in uh, Whitehaven. And there's also a, a rum museum in Lancaster. So sort of done everything that I could and I'd sort of come across this name um, of this guy called William Belgrove um just on i was just searching on one of the computers in the british library um and then it said you know he wrote a book in 1755 and i was like we're in the british library and they have a copy of every book so maybe it's here and then i was like tap tap on the computer and in the rare books section there was this book from 1755 so i could just tootle down there half an hour later they're like yeah here's the book and it was incredible getting this book that's hundreds of years old and they're like, yeah, there you go. You can't take it out, of course. You've got to sit at one of the desks. But going through that, so it was this guy um, who worked out in the Caribbean and he he figured out um, the sort of science behind making rum. So before him, it was very sort of rule of thumb, like splosh of this, bit of that, mix it round. It's vaguely rummy. It's not that great. And he was like, I, I want to, you know, really understand the science behind it. So exactly how much you know, of this ingredient, that ingredient, how long do you ferment it for, distill it for? Um, and so it was it was consistent and consistently high quality. So he, he was in pursuit of quality and also he didn't care what other people had done or that it had always been done that way. He was like, I'm going to do my own thing because this makes sense to me. So I, I love that. And also, you know, what I was doing with brand and flavor, I wasn't following others in terms of what they were doing with um, with their brand and flavor and always spiced and always pirate it. I was like, I'm going to do what makes sense to me. So it was that sort of yeah. pursuit uh, of, of what you want to do and not just following the crowd and what's always been done, like that desire to, you know, do something that you believe in and ends up being different to, to, to what others are. So I love that in terms of what that stood for, that sort of chimed with me because I was, I was doing my own path. Um, and also it sounded um, premium. So you've got Belgravia, Blue Caviar, Belvedere Vodka. Mm -hmm. And even if you sort of split it out in, you know, Bell and Grove in terms of Italian Beautiful Grove, even though that's obviously not a direct translation, but all the connotations are good. Mm -hmm. um, it's also easy to pronounce because, um, you know, I'd say guys are really you know if they're ordering in a bar if it's difficult to pronounce a lot of guys will be too proud to say like to try and pronounce something and make themselves look like a lemon um so they'd just rather yeah. order something else um mm -hmm. so easy to pronounce is really important um and also uh near the beginning of the alphabet because a lot of um like uh show guides in trade or consumer shows or on websites is listed alphabetically um so if you're doing the bbc good food show and you know there's you know 500 exhibitors consumers will flick through maybe a b you probably won't even make it to c so you've got to be at the beginning of the alphabet if um you want to get seen in that list you know mm -hmm. lots of things are alphabetical um so i need to be able to be dad's business that started with an a um so and he was like yeah it's always really good to be at the beginning of the alphabet um, yeah absolutely so yeah so yeah a lot of thinking into into that there's a monstrous amount of mm. course in a name um it sets the tone for the whole thing and i wanted it to be sort of um you know premium classic but also contemporary you know i think hendrix is a great name because it sort of mm -hmm. feels quite established and but still also cool um yeah so yeah you talk yeah. about um you talk about william belgrove yeah. The same way you talk about your science teacher. 
All right. So I would imagine yeah. that there was yeah. something about that story that really resonated yeah. with you by the yeah. sounds of how you're talking and yeah. he just did it anyway and he didn't care how yeah. people did it. Yeah. And he was wearing yeah. like Air Max and a puffy jacket and this yeah. guy was making room how yeah. he wanted to make it with yeah. the right amounts. And you're doing yeah. the same thing. So yeah. kindred spirits, perhaps. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do, yeah, both of their stories, yeah, do do love it, just sort of pursuit of what they love, what they believe in. Just fits. Um, yeah, yeah, like that a lot. And, and then what happened? So now you've you've created your room, you've got it up and running, you've got your brand, you've got your bottles, you've got it, yeah, you've got it made. Yeah. And yeah. then you said you, it was a bit scary pressing the button on having it yeah, bottles because, made. Yeah, I remember Pip from Pippa Nut, she said, you know, at some stage you just gotta, you know, pay the bill and press go and a little scary, but you've got to do it and you, you know, you'll be second guessing yourself. Oh, I got this right, I've got that right. Um, but you've just got to pick a brand, like, you know, whatever version of the brand you're going to go with, pick your, you know, your liquid and just and go with it. And it, it's going. super scary. And you're hoping that you've got it right, that you've done enough research that, you know, you, you've gauged it right. And it, yeah, of course, it's super scary, isn't it? Mm. Like, um, but you've got to do it. And like, you can't not, mm. you know, there's nothing else left to check or do. Just like I've got to put money where my mouth is and go from there. So if you had to distill down your business ethos into one phrase, what would it be? My ethos. Um the ethos of it. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I suppose there's a few little bits to it. Like it's the it's that Venn diagram and this only re- a lot of the things only really come like with the clarity of time and then looking back because in the moment and when I sort of tell people about my story they're like, oh yeah that sounds really intelligent you know really well thought out but big picture standing back that might look good and you know you know good decision to leave the company and do this you know it's all good but in the you know you only ever have the moment that you're in there and you just make the best decision that you have so at the time you know going back to Westmont it's a long way of explaining <laughs> giving my answer to this but um you know in the moment it was like well you know I want to start my own business haven't had the idea you know working a big job don't really have the brain space so I'm going to quit so it's only you know that's as big as that sort of sphere of decision making is so you make you know the best decision you can at the time and you know, that's it and then the next bit is, you know, struggling for inspiration. Let's have a look at trends in the industry. You know, then you get some ideas and then you go and chat to bar staff and you go, do you think a passion for it vodka would be any good? And so you do that bit. So it's, it's a lot smaller in terms of sort of what you look at in each time. You know, it makes sense, big picture, but you just, you know, it's like you're on a journey and you just you make the best decision at each juncture along the way. And you're like, oh, well, I'm going to figure out a flavor. So have a look in these areas and then run it past bartenders because they're going to know. So mm-hmm. in terms of distilling down a sort of ethos, um, that sort of Venn diagram of three circles in terms of do something that you've got some experience in, some strengths in, because doing your own business is tough enough. So if you've at least got one or two areas that you can boss, like that's going to be great. So for mine, it was, it was production um, and, you know, warehousing and distribution, you know, food and drink products. So do something in that sphere, Red, and then at least you've got that chunk because largely there's four chunks. There's making the thing, there's sales, there's marketing, and there's finance. So if I've got one of the chunks sort of boxed off, you know, Bosch, do that. So that's one circle do something that you know something about and then do something that you're passionate about and that you love. Um, because if, if you don't, you know, you're not gonna have the energy to get up in the morning. Um, and also when I was trying to come up with my idea and I hadn't had anything, dad was like, Oh, you know what you're passionate about, turn that into a business. So for him, it was antiques. He loved antiques. So, you know, worked really hard and that was his, you know, his career. Um, but I didn't have a specific passion that I, could turn into a business but for me the passion was in the market opportunity it was coming up with something clever that there was a gap for that that no one had done yet that was what i 
knew I would be passionate about when I came across it, which I did. So you've got that, that little sphere, which is, is loving it and being passionate about it. And then the third one um, is the market opportunity. And, you know, however good, you know, your product is, if your timing is off, you're stuffed. Or if, obviously, when you buy a product for the first time, you buy it with your eyes, you can't taste it on the shelf. So, you know, even if it tastes good, if it, does, if it looks rubbish, you know, give it up. Or if it looks great but tastes awful, people are never going to buy it more than once. So it's got to look good, taste good, and there's got to be a you know a market demand for it. Because even if it looks good and tastes great, if there's if there's no market, if there's no demand, you know if it's already saturated, you know a really great gin now won't do as well as it would have done four years ago. So it's massively on on timing as well. Um, so if you can get clarity on that sort of overlapping Venn diagram of uh, something you've got experience in, um, something you love, and market opportunity. If you've got those three, you know, there you've got a really good chance of of getting somewhere. So yeah, ethos of you know, try and fill out that Venn diagram as much as you can, and have as many elements as you can. You can get all three overlapping in the middle. Awesome, but you've got to do something that people actually want. Because I, I think you know a lot of ideas that you see or dragon's denny stuff and it's like you, you just don't need that that's just you know way over complicating it or you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't really exist you know make sure you've got that market demand um because without that you know because if even if you don't if you don't have any experience in it you can find people who do if you don't love it you can still physically do it but if there isn't the market demand you know, that's the most important one. No one's yeah. going to buy it. So, yeah, that would be making sure it's something. And in terms of, you know, because when people see it now, they're like, oh, wow, that's incredible timing you've done there, Red. And that, you know, I started it, you know, years before it was such good timing. And it was when I started hearing these whispers in the trade that rum was going to be the next thing. And all you can do is sort of see what's happened to gin understand their eight year cycles that rums four years behind extrapolate from there go oh, there's an opportunity in brand and pro and liquid and sort of it's your best guess because if you wait until the market is already booming it's too late to try and go about creating something and getting it out there so you have got to sort of uh, make an educated guess and do your homework and be like yeah, I reckon doing this. So there's always a bit of risk with anything, isn't there? And mm -hmm. if you want to try and, you know, be, be, you know, in amongst it when it's booming, you've got to start before it is booming. So you've got to sort of take a bit of a risk and make sure that timing's right. And by the time you're up and running and going places, you're not too early or too late. Mm -hmm. You're getting it. So the Venn diagram, that's my very long answer to the Venn diagram thing. <laughs> That's the a non-distilled non answer to yeah, exactly. it is the Venn diagram. <laughs> what yeah. are three non-negotiable behaviours of people that work with you? Um, I mean, on, on, like, you need that trust and honesty, um, like, absolutely massive. And once you find that trust and honesty, it's absolutely magical. So with my, um, so the brand designer who, who does all the bottles, um, she's brilliant, like, we're really honest with each other really trust each other and i can sort of say what i think or what i'd like and then like ask her opinion and you know if she agrees with me she'll say if she disagrees and that's just a wonderful sort of relationship like i'll make the final decision but if it's something that she feels really strongly about even if it goes against me she won't hesitate to say it and i won't hesitate to go with her if i think that's right so it's a really nice a really good respectful honest trustworthy relationship and that's absolutely magic and she's very good at her job very very great at creative and also technical so that sort of yeah finding people who you who you, who you work well with who you really trust you know really honest mm -hmm. um that yeah that's so you know immensely valuable especially when you're doing something like this and like for the new berry run we brought out, like there were a few tweaks in getting it there. So you want someone who, who you know, cares about it enough as well to not mind making a few little tweaks and working towards when you get to something that's, you know, gorgeous rather than quite good when you start off. It's like, no, we can do even better than this. So do that. So the kind of, the, the, the honesty, the trust and the care. And because 
she's been in it from the beginning she cares about it like it's her own because she's been you know working on it since you know before it launched um so yeah having that care that integrity um and that trust is is really good and having that with you know having that with all of you know your partners whether that's brand or bottling or warehousing um yeah the, the care the honesty the trust and the integrity all of those things are like all wrap up into one big one i know that's four but <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah but once you find those people like yeah you know really you know hold on to that because mm-hmm. yeah it's an absolute gem mm-hmm. yeah in your opinion, yeah, what is your superpower? Superpower, um, I think, it, yeah, it comes back to that. If, and I think I learned this probably from my West Mill days that if it if it feels wrong, it probably is wrong. If it's not sitting well with you, you need to check it. Um, and that's really you know good from the West Mill days. You know, if something smelt wrong a motor could be burning out or if it looks wrong, you know, there's always something. So that sort of the, the eye for detail, the picking up and not, you know, making sure you've checked everything, um, you know, double check that the barcode on the new version of artwork is definitely the correct one, you know, make sure, you know, the, you know, the paper stock for the little label that goes over the stock is stock is a correct one because, you know, that's different to the main label. So yeah, checking and checking. And, you know, I do love planning. I see a lot of value in planning and, and, you know, prepping everything, whether that's, you know, ahead of a product launch or a photo shoot, you know, planning and preparing and, and checking, they'll serve you really well. If you neglect some of them, you'll be fine for a bit because you don't always get tripped up. But, you know, if you don't do any planning or any checking, it'll really sting you when it hurts and like, Oh, how's this happened? You know, and people will think it's, you know, in the lap of the gods and that's bad luck that it hasn't gone well. Um, but it's just, you know, poor planning and poor checking. So yeah, being on it, but I think I I definitely got that from my, from my West Mill days because a lot of, a lot of that, whether it was supply planning or being a shift manager, you know, your quality checks, making sure, you know, the integrity of the drums are right. It's the correct oil everything's as it should be it (laughs) does it does it drills into you those sort of routines and rituals of making sure every product you make is is perfect um so yeah a lot of westworld to thank for for that for your superpower yeah what what is the most common misconception of you and what would you say to set it straight oh of me um i don't know (laughs) I don't know. I guess by default, I can't really know because it'll be in other people's heads. Um, but you sit around and drink rum all day. Yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I sit around and drink yeah. rum, and it's really easy. Um, and it's yeah, yeah. A lot of people do do think it is, and, and you know, the amount of people who say, "Oh, if you're ever looking for a tester, someone who you know oh. just to run it past," and it's like, no, no, I'm not looking for some random person <laughs> yeah. to no, collect my rum. <laughs> so that, that always tickles me um mm-hmm. but yeah probably probably that you know they think it's you know you just sit around drinking rum and i think i mean understandably they don't see that yeah to drink rum is is a nice thing but that is outweighed a thousand to one by the stresses and the pressures that rely on me making a good decision that rely the rest, on you tasting the rum yeah and the you know the rest of you know the business and the expansion and the rest of my life essentially sounds a bit dramatic all rests on me making the right decision in terms of um overall direction of flavor and then this specific flavor profile so there is there is no pleasure in it so but once it's bottled and you've got it right i remember with the spice fig and blackberry being at we'd all gone around to my mate luke's house i think we go, I think we're just going around for dinner or something, or maybe the Euros are on or something. And that was the first time I'd taken a like a new bottle around, Bosch, this is it. Because I chatted a lot to them in the early days when I was designing the hazelnut in terms of flavor and brand, just like him and his wife just to sort of chat it over. But we were all there, all the mates, and we all had rum and cokes. And it was the first time I'd actually um 
focused on just enjoying it. Like I, I know, drank the room. <laughs> yeah, like I know it tastes good because I've spent many hours getting it good, and now I can enjoy it without analysing it. Mm-hmm. And I can just enjoy rum and coke, and everyone loved it, and I loved it, and that was the first like relaxing time of actually having. That was for the new rum, um, and just really enjoying it. So, um, yeah, the the process is is a lot more stressful than people think. It's only yeah. afterwards you can enjoy drinking the rum. Yeah. What What would you tell your teenage self? Um, what would I tell my teenage self. Um. Well, you know, like when when you're young, like like working hard for your GCSEs and A levels and all of that sounds like it just seems like a nightmare at the time. And like so many other people, you know, you'd find anything to procrastinate over. But it is really good. And even though people think, you know, anything I learned there isn't really useful, it is really useful. And also it teaches you a really good work ethic for, you know, GCSEs going to A levels, going to uni and onwards and jobs and anything, even if you don't do uni. But yeah, you do get a really good work ethic from it, I think. Um, and also you learn a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff that is actually really useful later in life. You might not realise it is, but um, yeah, do work hard. Do work hard in school because it is, it is really useful. But at the time, you know, you know, you get told to work hard and do you listen? You're like, yeah, yeah, sure. But, yeah. but I did work hard and yeah, yeah, glad I did. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, do, do work hard. It will pay off. Yeah. Okay. If there was a movie to be made about your life, what would it be called and which yeah. actor would play you? Um, Nick Cage, because he's the best terrible actor ever. You know, <laughs> every, uh, like like um, Conair, favourite movie of all time, because Nick Cage is incredible, and Face Off, incredible. So he would play it. Um, oh, what would it be called? Well, I'm, I am, you know, like a, a very diligent planner. So it would probably be... Uh, 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 a sort of very boring practical title like the 4,200 steps to creating a rum company (laughs) 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 it would would be as sort of specific and as boring as that but it would be a very informative movie a very good film (laughs) yeah but it's not that action focused so yeah it'd probably be that (laughs) I'd, I'd watch that I'd watch it yeah yeah right that'd be like we, practical yeah we have some quick fire questions now yes. which are yeah. this or that yeah are you ready yes okay phone or text phone email or meeting meeting tea or coffee tea yeah beach holiday or skiing holiday beach Dogs or cats? Mm, neither. Because <laughs> cats, cats you give less but get get less. Dogs you give more but get more. So neither one is great value. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Spoken like a true physicist. Well, actually, when you do the calculations, neither. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask you the next one: sweet or savory? Uh, both 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 are equally as good De- it depends it depends I do like them I could, you know, at the end of a night almost always have to have something sweet like a little bit of a biscuit or like or even a bit of fruit just so you get some sweetness or a yogurt but I couldn't do without I couldn't do without savoury so are you, both. A, are you a finish finish strong on something sweet sort of guy yeah yeah it doesn't yeah. need to be big but just a something and it's like nice end of the meal yeah yeah okay final quick fire question yeah does pineapple belong on pizza a hundred percent yes the yeses are absolutely strong. love it, the yeses absolutely are love it. because it's the sweetness goes with the saltiness of the ham it's genius love it sweet and salty so you're a hawaiian pizza man yeah all day yeah. all day all every day, day. <laughs> okay yeah, love it so the the final question is one that was left from the last guest. So every guest oh, will leave yeah. a question for the next person to be interviewed. And yeah. your question is, yeah. what's the fear? What is it that makes you frightened? Um, In a business context, don't say sharks. Well, I was going to say the dark. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I guess that. I guess that the fear is sort of yeah, what drives me as well. It's that fear of failure of being like, oh, you you weren't good enough to create a successful business, like. But that that sort of imposter syndrome um, is really good at, at motivating you because that's the reason I wanted to create it was so I could. It was like the the pinnacle, the intellectual pinnacle for me was having created um, a really good business with a really good product that was great for the market, that was a demand for, and a really like slickly designed and operated company behind the brand. Um, so yeah, that fear of failure and oh, you haven't created something that's that's that good, but then that motivates you to create something that's excellent. So you mm-hmm. you, you sort that. So it is. Um, it, it's a very useful little motivator, but useful yeah, fear. yeah, the fear of it not being good enough. Edmund, Excellent. that was absolutely amazing. I loved hearing yeah. about your story. And You're if very someone welcome. wants to pick up a bottle of Belgrove from, where yes. can they get it from? Um, so it's in ninety Asda stores around the UK, the Spice Fig and Blackberry Rum, um, and on our Instagram at Belgrove Rum, that's where the list of stores is. Um, so Asda is the best. Uh, and then after that, I mean, get it on online Asda as well. If there's an Asda stocking it near you, if you can't go in store, but Amazon as well. Um, mm-hmm. Amazon's great or Master of Malt. Um, just Google Belgrove Rum and you'll find lots of I lots of places. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Edmund. That was absolutely amazing to speak to you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, listeners, for listening in. And if you've got any questions or you want to get in touch with Edmund, I'm sure he would absolutely be delighted for you to at him at Belgrove Room on Instagram or drop him an email. And of course, you know where yeah, I am. At yeah. So thank you very much for listening, everyone. Until next time. Yeah. Thank you, Eve. Thanks so much.